Hi everyone. Uh, welcome once more to this session of Amazing Grace. As you know, Amazing Grace is a series of conversations that I'm having with contemporary women leaders doing extraordinary things. And today I have the pleasure of uh, chatting with Lorna Solis. She is a World Fellow from last year. She is also the founder and CEO of Blue Rose Compass. And um, she's just an amazing woman doing incredible things. So let's unpack this a bit. Welcome, Laura, uh, Lorna, Thank to you, the uh, Facebook session. So first of all, would you like to tell our audience who you are, where you're from? Sure. Uh, so thank you, everybody. I think people are Skyping in from India, so I know it's late for you, so we'll, we'll be quick and to the point uh, so you can go to sleep. Um, I was born in Nicaragua, which is in Central America. Um, actually, today there's a huge crisis that's that's going on, um, which I am also a part of. Yes. Um, but we're here to talk about uh, Blue Rose Compass and perhaps Great Techie. So I was born in Nicaragua, and at age nine, I had to leave because of the war. And um, uh, my family and I, we came to the U.S. and we went to live with my half German grandmother, who was living in San Francisco. Um, so, hey, Rama. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, went to live in San Francisco. So I, I was raised in the U.S. and I've been here since I'm nine years old, but I still feel very Nicaraguan, um, very split in the middle between the love for America and the love for my birth country, which my family's still there. My parents went back, so more, and I visit. So, I, you know, there's that proximity of visiting home. And what does Nicaraguan mean to you, being a Nicaraguan? Um, it's funny. Um, you know how like character traits of, of one thing or the other? So I'm very, I say I'm very American with some things and I'm very Latin with other things. I mean, Latin America, it's, it's about family. It's about um, trust. It's about loyalty. I mean, I'm not saying the U.S. is not, but I, I think um, like when I have a business meeting even, um, being from Latin America, when I was covering Africa for a former job that I had for 16 years, it, it was always like, you know, uh, uh, who, who are you? And getting to know the person before we actually started the actual meeting. So it was important to actually get to know the person. And there's this thing about if I like you, I trust you, therefore I'll do business with you mm -hmm. versus just like the hardcore numbers and just uh, you know more about facts. It was more about the, the person first. The relationship. The relationship first. And I'm a relationship builder. And I think that's why I was effective in my former job of 16 years because I like people and if I like you, you're my friend. So it's, it was always, it was, it, I mean, it was about the work, but it was first about the person. And those relationships I still have today, and I'm talking like central bank governors and ministers of finance and heads of states, and this was my, my former mm -hmm. finance job, my pre-humanitarian um, uh, world job. Uh, and I continue to be that today. I think who you are who you are. That's um, true. But I think in that sense, I'm very, I would say, Latin in that part. So that Nicaragua is definitely in my DNA. So I, it sounds like you're very Indian as well. <laughs> That's why I asked the question, what is Nicaraguan? Because, you know, often we have much more in common, yes. but we tend to focus on differences. And I'm trying yes. to bring this up through all these conversations. So it comes back to my next question. Um, what are the three adjectives that you would use to describe yourself? Um, uh, definitely loyal. Uh, I am loyal to the core and I'll have your back and you can always count on me so my close friends know that you know whatever it is I'm there and that's not so common anymore I mean if you can name five people that you can say you know if you're in a really difficult situation you can call that person no matter what time and they'll jump on a plane to come mm -hmm. like I'm I'm that person and don't get me don't get me wrong I'm not that person with a hundred people sure. I'm, I'm with a, it's, it's it's also a handful yes. but the point is that Actually, one's watching us right now from, from India. Yeah, she's, uh, she says she, you're going to rule the world. <laughs> oh, I missed that. <laughs> well, she's ruling it already uh, in a job. She said she's already doing it in India. You, need to, you have to interview her next. But um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I think it, you, to your point, um, absolutely. I think, you know, my, 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 my best friend here from India, we we're, we're a lot alike and, and, and uh, Food is also something that bonds us together, and um, and and 
it's the people thing. It's it's really about we're 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 about the, the relationships and nurturing them. Um, and that's that's a big piece, by the way, in the nurturing them. Yeah. We don't do enough of that. So loyal, nurturing. Oh, sorry. Uh, I actually wouldn't have that as a. As, uh, I am nurturing, but I would say um, second. Well, I would say passionate. Mm-hmm. If it's clearly, it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. So, so, oh, oh my no. God! Then I really need to see when you're passionate. No, no, no. About something. Uh, yeah, and that gets me into trouble because I, 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 if you're when you're very passionate, also sometimes you have blinders, and so imagine very loyal, passionate, and. Uh, it's great when you're, and I'm fighting always for injustices, so mm-hmm. or for justice against injustices, and so uh, the passion has to be there, or else you can't do this work, right? True. I mean, when you're when you're fighting the good cause and you're up against Goliath, because Goliath has uh, all the uh, legal ways to block visas and do things for my, for the scholarships for our students, yeah. or um, I mean, so much injustice that I've seen with my work is unbelievable, and it's like they're the gatekeeper so sure. so when you're up against that you have to have passion if you don't have passion it, especially in the space i'm in now you can't do this work it's yeah. just impossible no, um, true. and it ha- and it ha- and i would say the thirdly authenticity if you're not authentic with the passion also it's not going to work so it's 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 one thing saying i believe in blah but if you're not real about that it's not, it, 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 you're not authentic about the reasons why you're there and why you're doing it, it won't last. Yes, true. And, uh, you know, it's a long-term game. So coming back to Blue Rose Compass. So I took a, I did, not I took on, I did, but I audited a class <laughs> at the School of Management at Yale. And the class was called, uh, is called, rather it's still on, The Design of Business and the Business of Design. And uh, one day we had the Blue Rose Compass as a case study. So Lorna is the founder and CEO of Blue Rose Compass. And I'm going to ask her to tell you a little bit about what is Blue Rose Compass? What was the inspiration behind Blue Rose Compass? And uh, why did you, you know, come to Yale SOM yeah, that sure, day? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so Blue Rose Compass is an NGO that I started uh, over 10 years ago. So way before the Syria crisis, because I think there's a pre and post refugee world mm-hmm. because from, from uh, with when you bring Syria into the picture, um, politically, geographically, is just really, um, and media-wise, exposure-wise, it's really just changed the conversation about refugees. So I, I started doing this before. Um, and it really started just with one student that I, well, one person that I met at the Dab refugee camp in Kenya, uh, who through other people, it wasn't just me, there were, it was a collective group of people who we had connections at Princeton University, and long story short, he was able to go from the Dab refugee camp to Princeton University. And at Princeton, I basically like adopted him, and um, because his whole family was still in this camp, so um, I, and I didn't have a setup. Blue Rose Compass was not yet in anything. It was just it was I'm just helping, a project. I'm just helping a person yes. that I knew I could help. Mm-hmm. As by the way, everyone should do. Like if you don't need to have some mm-hmm. organization to do do good things mm-hmm. for people and do good things you can just do it right you don't have to be have a, and that's what I and that's what I did so and I was still doing my finance job at the time so I was still very fulfilled in my career um, and um, wasn't thinking of of leaving it at all I was very happy where I was it was our 16 years mm. um, and again not thinking at all to leave but after seeing what my intervention did with this one person um, and how it transformed his life uh, and then the next student, and the next student, and the next student, I, I decided to leave my career of 16 years to do this full time. I never knew how hard it would be. So Blue Rose Compass, and I know it's a very convoluted name, and we won't get into the name, but all, all I'll say is that Rose is the my grandmother, right? So there's always a grandma, and yes. I don't care. I don't, <laughs> see, again, there's you probably have something similar. So there's like a grandma somewhere, somewhere in your journey, or a grandfather maybe, but for me it's my grandmother. And Rose is my grandmother, my, my half German grandmother, who I who I grew up with, uh, the love of my life, my inspiration, and uh, I think all the hardships she went through in her life. Just whenever I think I'm having a bad day, I think of what she went through, and then my stuff just disappears. And it's I think it's great to have a reference. I mean, I'm fortunate for her because she had a really difficult life, but for me, her her difficulties have been my strength. 
Mm -hmm. And um, I literally will think of her all the time. She's passed away, but we talk all the time, if you understand yes. that. <laughs> so, I mean, I still ask her questions. Okay, maybe that's creepy, but <laughs> she just she does respond. <laughs> she gives you signs. <laughs> she gives me signs. Um, and she's very much around me. She's very much still part of my, my life. How can you not? It was yeah. Someone you spoke to three times a day forever. Um, and so my, my work, uh, essentially we give scholarships to, to refugees um, in all parts of the world. So I started in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, moved to the Middle East, and then it was mostly Palestinians, Afghanis, Iraqis, and then Syria happened. Mm -hmm. And that just completely changed everything for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't just give scholarships. So explain right. to our audience uh, what kind of scholarships you give and sure. who are these students? So I focus on students. I, I focus on the, I hate to say the brightest because it's also unfair. A lot of these kids and that have been displaced, um, it's, not, it's not that they're, they're not bright. Um, maybe they are incredibly academically talented, but because they have to work for jobs or because they, because of their situation, they've fallen behind. So our very difficult job is to speak to the teachers and find out who are these kids, even if uh, on paper they may not look as the most gifted, but the teachers know. Thank God for teachers, by the way, because the teachers know, uh, and you don't have to just rely on data, you will, I will, again, it's the relationship, I rely on the teachers, I rely on the mm -hmm. principals, I rely on, and they'll tell me like, listen, this, this kid, I had this happen before, um, this one teacher said, this one boy is by far the smartest in my class, but he's failing miserably because his father was killed in Syria and he literally is a breadwinner for the whole family and he has to, to uh, he has four jobs. So he's failing, but not because he's not smart and he was, he's part of our program. So, and I'm delighted to be able to help um, kids that are in that position because if it weren't for us, like they're never gonna make it at school. So we really identify these incredible gems that are having really hard times. And some of them are academic, like they're, they're scoring high, but many of them are not, and you have to find, find them. And that's a lot of work. Um, and we send them to the best universities. I mean, from, so from Princeton University to UCL in the UK, to Stellenbosch, to Tsinghua University. Um, now we're sending, the biggest thing is we're sending a thousand Syrian refugees to Argentina, and that's wow. a long story, that's a bigger story, um, to one of the best universities in Latin America, it's the University of Buenos Aires, in the capital in Buenos Aires, and we're starting with a pilot of 50 next year. Wow. Um, so that's gonna, that's a big journey. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, thank good you. Luck. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had the privilege of working on um, part of the problem that Laura presented to us in the class, and it was, the entire um, session was a rebranding exercise, and we had to look at the name in particular, my, my group, and uh, I understood the passion that she has for the word rose in Blue Rose Compass. And, um, you know, I also feel for you because as a founder, you know, yes, you randomly pick the name, but there is a method to the madness and it has some significance. And whilst others may not, you know, there's always a reason why you've picked the name. But of course, I also find it very courageous of you to want to change the whole uh, thing and change the whole name. I mean, I don't know if I could have, I would have the same courage as you to change the entire uh, name of my organization. Uh, anyway, so you had a career, a successful career of 16 years in the finance industry. So tell us what did you do there? So I was head of Latin America and Sub-Saharan Latin America Sub-Saharan Africa for Institutional Investor, which is a financial publication. Before that, I worked on Wall Street um, for a bit, and that was totally not for me. But I did mm -hmm. do my 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 bit um, on Wall Street. And at Institutional Investor, my job was to work with governments uh, in these two regions, and was, I was I was mostly focused on infrastructure projects, so PPP projects. So we would do reports on investment opportunities let's say in different parts of, of Africa. So I would travel, what I loved about the job is the amount of travel I did. So at a very young age, it's great if you can get a job that sends you <laughs> to all different parts of the world. So I mean, not many people have been to Cape Verde, because of course I've been to all the, 
uh, all the obvious places in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, of course, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, but when you go to Togo, Gambia, yeah. um, I mean, Senegal maybe would still be up there, but um, Madagascar, Mauritius, like, I mean, that's, by the way, Mauritius, the entire place, it's like, it's like a resort, it's right? A it's resort, the most yeah. beautiful thing you've ever seen. So I'm like, do you pay me to go to these places? <laughs> Cape Verde, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so, and I, I it's, it was like going into a National Geographic expedition, mm-hmm. but my job was to talk to uh, central bank governors, bankers, CFOs of companies, heads of states, and and um, what a privilege that at a really young age, I would have that kind of exposure. Absolutely. Um, so I was incredibly blessed by not only getting to see these countries, and it was interesting, Cape Verde, like everyone plays an instrument. And, like, every, really? Every person I would speak to, wow. yeah, because their, their thing on the weekend is getting together. So was, I would say to the CFO of one company, oh, he's like, yeah, I know you're seeing so-and-so later. I'm like, how did you know that? Because they're all friends, it's a tiny place, a and they all talk to place. each other. And, and so one's like, well, I played the guitar, and so-and-so plays the piano, and so we all get together on weekends, and we, and, and so you find, I learned so much about cultures, and I, so I'm a, yes, I'm a National Geographic fanatic, I'm a, because learning about different cultures, and food, and whatever it is, I find that fascinating, and I was very lucky that I was able to see this mm-hmm. firsthand, and not only like as a visitor, but I was there doing work, mm-hmm. so they kind of had to talk to me. So by, by having that interaction too, you just learned so much. I mean, so it was, it was wonderful. True. And um, so how difficult was it to make that switch, to give up all this luxury and this uh, immense travel that you so enjoy yeah. and <laughs> making that hard decision to work on humanitarian work? You know, it was very organic. I didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to go and work with refugees. It was absolutely not that way. Um, I started with one person, right? And I didn't have a setup. And it was only after the sixth kid that I decided to leave, but it had to do with 9-11. So 9-11 was a huge catalyst for me. I was in New York City when it happened. And being Nicaraguan, when I left uh, because of the war when I was nine, there were helicopters in the day and night, and those helicopters were actually shooting at you or you know doing bad things. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I remember this. And so as a as here I, now I was an adult, um, and there were helicopters outside of my window in New York, and I didn't know, know this, but I had PTSD. And of course, PTSD mm-hmm. only comes up when some has been triggered by something. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea I had PTSD. So here I was in my high-rise apartment in New York City, sleeping on the floor, because I thought people were gonna shoot into my apartment. Of course it was not gonna happen, yeah. but this was uh, from the fear of, from when I was nine years old, it just all came up all over again. And I had this sense of urgency that I had to do something, because as a nine-year-old, I wasn't able to, I was a child, mm-hmm. so my, my parents were protecting us, right? But here as an adult, I, I felt I needed to do something. So day two uh, of 9-11, so that was the 12th of September, I went to the Red Cross because the first day you just it was like a day of I was you were a zombie you didn't know what was going on not all the news was there we were still trying to figure out what was happening um, it was a very confusing day people were walking in the street like I mean, not knowing what to say and it was just mm-hmm. it was just a day of crisis and panic but day two I was literally uh, I beeline to the Red Cross which was not far from where I live and I just worked my way I don't know how I did it mm-hmm. up to the front desk because there were thousands of people there and they were people all trying to um, volunteer uh, everything okay. looking for looking for loved ones people didn't know where to go sure. so either I mean it, it wasn't like there's a crisis and there's there's a manual it, mm. that's, that, that's what happens when there's a crisis it's so chaos. people were going to hospitals people I mean so, mm. so at the Red Cross people wanted to volunteer people were looking for loved ones people were looking for information it was everything mm-hmm. anything goes mm-hmm. but I was there to like you know Lay my, lay my hands and say, what can I do to help? And I did. So I, I, I worked my way to the front and I don't know what look I had on my face, but I said, you have to use me. And I think the woman was just afraid. And so she <laughs> gave me an address and I thought, oh my gosh, she's getting rid of me. <laughs> and she wasn't. She gave me an address of, of, of an office of the Red Cross and they gave me um, keys. I mean, I had to like do a two hour uh, video, sitting okay. there and watching a video. I love that this was the training. Remember, this is like crisis mode, yeah. right? And I was driving a 16-passenger a, a van really? in Manhattan into Ground Zero, picking up uh, with a friend of mine, picking up 
um, volunteers who had been there working all day long, mm -hmm. and we would take them from ground zero to their hotel. That was the job. It was just to take Fairy volunteers, people. like Red Cross, you know, first-hand mm -hmm. responders. So I am a first-hand responder because there's, I mean, mm -hmm. I have to have my tags. I have my, very proudly, I still have my Red Cross tags and my vest. Uh, clearly marking the Red Cross, you know, huge. I still have all of that, and it's a big piece of me. But at that moment, um, I just, I don't know. I think it, it's like maybe unconsciously, I just <clears> knew <throat> things needed to shift for me. I was mm -hmm. very happy where I was, but 9-11 did something to me. Okay. It shifted something in me, but it wasn't obvious to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was um, only maybe two years later that I began to work with refugees. Okay. And then, and then after a year, I decided, well, actually, no, more than that, two years, I decided to leave my career. So it took a while, but it's it was organic. Yeah. And it was organic. It was more like 9-11 was big. Um, and then just seeing my, seeing how these kids' lives would change. Mm -hmm. Once you drink that Kool-Aid, it's really <laughs> hard. Yeah, tell me else, about it. You know? Tell me about it. Um, so we have Giomara from Nicaragua. Ah, and hola. Yeah, we'll get to that <laughs> oh, set of wow. questions. But, um, you know, I really want to ask you about uh, the other work that you do, that is uh, coding with girls. Is it only with girls or with young no, people? Young people. And, okay. So and tell us a little bit about sure. that. Sure. And that's pivoted, uh, a word I learned in my entrepreneurship life. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's pivoted quite a bit. Um, that's actually even the name pivoted from Link to Grit Techie. <laughs> so um, Grit Techie, in essence, is uh, we partner with entities who do the coding and programming training. All so we don't do it. We were gonna do it, and then we we're like, why would why do we reinvent the wheel? I always, I believe in partnering with organizations. So if they can do that part, we'll do the part they're sure. not doing, and then everyone wins. Yeah. So uh, there are entities who are already doing that work on the ground in Jordan and in Gaza. And we're also setting up in Venezuela. Actually, this is something that hasn't been launched yet. It's, oh, it's wow. going to launch, but finding the partners has taken a bit. And also the crisis in Nicaragua has absolutely made all my other work go a little slower mm. because I'm focusing a lot of energy on Nicaragua as well because um, it's another crisis, right? So it's yeah. like one crisis after, after another. But uh, what, so the part that I'm focusing on for Grit Techie is the employment part. So while we have a, a local partner who does the training for web development mm -hmm. um, for, again, refugees and also impoverished people in these communities. So it, it's uh, in Jordan, it'll be for, to Jordanians who are um, who also can't find work. Mm -hmm. So this is like lower income Jordanians, right? Because they're also suffering. It's not just about refugees. I mean, also the local, the local hosting community suffers from what's happening. In Gaza, it's everybody because they're all Palestinians and it's everybody. And in Venezuela, also it's everybody. Like that entire country, I, I feel, is, is suffering. And the idea is that um, we'll offer you three options as, um, it, as someone coming into our platform. So number one, you can work on the platform um, doing web development. Kind of like think of Fiverr or Amazon mm -hmm. Mechanical Turk. So what they do is you're always bidding on the next job. And we found that after speaking to people on the ground and our, a lot of our students who use those platforms already, mm -hmm. what do you like, what do you not like? So mm -hmm. we did a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. bottom up because I like to work bottom up, you know, and, and they told us what they liked and did not like. And based on that, basically that feedback is what made Grid Techie. So we have Fortune 500 companies who are giving us work continuously. And the idea that you're working for, let's say this big company, that's out of wherever, somewhere yeah. in New York, and they're getting to know you. Uh, think of a long-term or a or a um, long-distance internship. Okay. So you could be you're doing the work for this company for eight months uh, through this our platform, but they're getting to know who you are. And so what's beautiful is number one, you're getting paid. So that number one is like let's say you're Fatima and you are a Syrian and you're in Jordan, okay? Mm -hmm. So number one, you can just continue working on the platform and that's that's fine. Number two, we say this company loves what you're doing. They're like, you know, Fatima has all the skills that we need in a job in Sweden. So based on your nationality, we can figure out where, what country we can get you a visa mm -hmm. in or a work permit. You're no longer a refugee, by the way. And that's something yeah. we've been, because we already- And there's this, dignity but, in this. Of course. It, I mean, everything I do is to have people be self-reliant. And to, to, so people can just have control over their lives. So even with my nonprofit, the idea is that 
here's the education and he, and we also linked them to the job by the way so it's mm -hmm. not just the education we also get them internships and and we link them to their full-time job because without that that job at the end the education is not enough i mean i know entities that just give scholarships i'm like well what about the job will they worry about that i'm like but they're they come at already at a disadvantage. They don't have the networks you and I have. So we become that network. Yeah. So with a job, with a, with Great Techie, it's very similar. So we also identify the companies. They can offer you a job. So now I can say to Fatima, mm -hmm. would you like to move to Sweden and work sure. for this company? And she has options. Yes. And she's not going there as a refugee. She's Correct. going there as a worker. Correct. And, with yeah. a work permit. And right. so we don't have to worry about deportation and this and that and sure. visa and refugee status, sure. which is always an issue in the world today. Um, gets worse and worse by the minute. So, uh, uh, Giomaro uh, says Nicaragua must uh, be next. Okay. So, why don't you tell uh, everyone out there what's happening in Nicaragua? Sure. I um, actually gave a talk yesterday uh, at Yale on Nicaragua, um, which breaks my heart. So, my little country of six million people, we're only six million, but we're, and we're not making a lot of noise, which is mm -hmm. a which is a problem. And which is why people in India have no clue what's happening because it's such a tiny country, so I far know. away from us, and uh, therefore, you know, it's not that important in the scheme of things. I know, but I know. it's uh, sad. Yeah, um, it's really sad. And I have been following my friends in Nicaragua, so I know. But I would love for you to share. Uh, sure. You know what's happening. So since April eighteenth of this year, um, from that day to today, we have over three hundred people killed, over two thousand wounded, over five hundred in prison, for doing nothing but protesting peacefully. And this is something that started on April eighteenth. By the way, being killed by the government. So the government has sent out police, mm -hmm. military, and paramilitaries to kill civilians, wow. oppress. Uh, jail. So if you speak against the government, if you, um, um, I mean, there was a woman called Doña Coquito. Mm -hmm. um, she's in her, she's a grandmother, a uh, little old lady who was incarcerated because she was giving water to the mothers who were outside of the prison waiting to find out how their, how their, their loved ones were doing because they don't even give you information or they're there with food because they, they don't feed them. So they're trying mm -hmm. to like, here's food. Anyhow, so she, she wasn't selling a lot of water that day. So she's like, you know, I'm just going to give it away. Yeah. And she was incarcerated. Wow. I mean, so it, a grandmother who a was grandmother. just giving water to people waiting to uh, hear from their families. Correct. Um, and, 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 and this all started because of the social security reform. Mm -hmm. So the president announced that basically they were making these horrible cuts to social security and people went out to complain mm -hmm. and the first group of people were killed. So imagine the police sent out police, the, the, sorry, the government, the president sent out and the first lady who's also the vice president. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, um, that's another that's, story. That's a whole other, and she's also a proclaimed witch. I can actually say oh that she God. calls herself a witch. Really? Yes. Okay. You can't even make this up. I mean, really, whoever wants to do a movie doesn't even have to get creative. Just state the facts because it's pretty, it's pretty people are like, are you kidding? I'm like, no, I'm not kidding. So anyhow, so we, um, actually it's not funny, but it's, it's funny, but not, it's funny because it's, it's so outrageous, but it's like, it's real. So the um, so they sent out police with real bullets, not rubber bullets, not tear gas bombs, real bullets, and mm -hmm. killed the first um, group of people. And after that, Nicaraguans have not stopped marching. It's wow. been the most unbelievable. I mean, we've never seen this before. We had um, the, the um, Mother's Day, which was May thirtieth. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of Nicaraguans. We're only six million people. When I see the videos, I'm thinking, were there like a million people marching? Mm -hmm. it, it was unbelievable. The amount of everyone, all my cousins were on the street. Everybody was on the street marching. And all the front rows were the mothers that had just lost their children. And the police went out and killed people. That day, 17 mm -hmm. more people were killed. My goodness. And the sort of, the, and the sort of, uh, the sort of tortures that we're hearing about, the sort of, um, and it's all like, again, it, so the head of the peasant movement is, is in prison right now, uh, head of the uh, from civil society, of course, being targeted massively, because mm -hmm. that's the point. You oppress, you know, you oppress um, civil society, you oppress, um, yeah, you oppress anyone who speaks ill of, of the government. And, and it's like there's two parallel word, worlds. If you look at the Twitter accounts mm -hmm. from, the, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the government, um, it's incredible. It's like nothing's happening. Everything is peaceful and everything is great. 
and then you read the other news, it's like so many people were killed today, and then you read the other news, like, oh, the folkloric uh, uh, ceremony of the whatever is happening here, and here are these great children dancing, and I'm like, what is going on? Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's incredibly painful. I don't know how this is going to end. Um, I, the nice thing about, I have to say, the, the, the US and, and EU is that they're giving a lot of support to the, to the opposition. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and we have bipartisan support in the US. Okay. Um, and this goes back to, I mean, Reagan thought he took care of Ortega. So mm -hmm. we, of course, have the Republicans because this is like historical. And then, of course, Democrats who want a dictator. So we mm -hmm. really have support on both sides um, to do things. But you know, it's not it's not over. It's a, it's a I don't know how long this is going to take to and that normalize. Now has given you a third job, right? Yeah, and I can't talk more. I can't talk a lot about that because I okay. don't know how many so, Nicaraguans are watching. This. So don't don't talk about that. But uh, maybe you can give us a few uh, tips as to how we can the larger global community can. Uh, support uh, your people sure I mean I think so there there are quite a bit of uh, civil society organizations who are doing great work mm -hmm. there is a hashtag SOS Nicaragua and if you follow that hashtag you will find um, a lot of information on what's going on in Nicaragua um, they have a website as well so mm -hmm. I, I would uh, urge to to go there and whenever you see a petition, like sign this petition for this sanction or this or that, I, I would urge people to to do that as well. Um, but it's uh, yeah, I mean this is it's a it's a it's a horrible thing. It's it's and you know the Nicaragua is not far from the U.S. It's it's it, and I think that's also I have to say good or not good why all the southern states are supportive of like do, getting something mm -hmm. resolved. Is because the moment you say they're gonna come here, yes. all the new, and they're so imagine the moment you say that you have I mean, every peace, governor on board. Peace is good is for sad, everyone but... because I don't think even Nicaraguans want to come to the U.S. I mean, they want to come here to shop and you know as a tourist, but not necessarily to flee their country. So, well, we, would... actually, Nicaragua was one of the only country on the World Bank list that was not on the list. Of, of, of Central Americans coming to the US mm -hmm. for, for many years uh, you didn't have there were no like whatever issues or I don't want to call it issues but Nicaragua was not even on the list mm -hmm. and now of course it's going to be because of what's happening there are yeah. already over 20,000 um, uh, Nicaraguans exiled in Costa Rica Okay. already since April well I hope you you know for your country and for your uh, you know country people this crisis ends yes um, and what is the message that you would like to give to the young people especially the young women out there sure um, I, you know it's interesting I've, I've always worked in developing countries and I find that there's again so many commonalities Number one, you matter, you have a voice, you can do anything you want. Um, even if you feel like the world is up against you, even if you feel like uh, you, can't, you don't have access to things, there's always someone that breaks that mold. And we, even if you, you've, you've heard of someone else that's done it in another country, it can absolutely be replicated. Um, try to find mentors. I, I didn't have mentors, except my grandmother, but like, academic mentors and I, I wish um, I had had that and I just didn't have that um, my parents were dealing with a revolution and a war mm -hmm. and when I was growing up so they were a little preoccupied with that um, so for those of you that are adolescents I would say absolutely find some mentors who can help you make decisions of what you're going to study and where you could end up working and maybe you don't um, waste so many years after trying to catch up to that yeah. and have more of a plan. By the way, the plan may change many <laughs> times and that's okay. Uh, mine changed many times. But I, it, so I think finding mentors is, is, uh, is important. Great. So on that note, um, I thank you for joining us and thank you Lorna thank for you, sharing Elsa. all your wonderful words of wisdom and your life's journey with us. Uh, this is really a series to inspire people out there, especially young women with uh, role models from different fields, from different countries. 
um life is never simple it's always a journey the path is never linear it's it always has its curves and bends but um what comes out is resilience passion humility um you know the drive to continue and keep moving forward so you actually touched on all of it <laughs> and i'm really really thankful and grateful for this time that we had together oh, thank you for having me and <laughs> thank you everyone for watching okay see you next time bye